Okay, everyone, we're getting to the end of this course and I know that we've covered so much and I'm hoping that you've got some great tools for understanding scripture, reading it for yourself in such a way as to, yes, understand it, apply it, but even more importantly, know the God of scripture in a more real and powerful and life-giving way. I'm also hoping that you're seeing that we're just scratching the surface. And so that means that every single one of us will continue to be students of Scripture because man, oh man, there is always more to know, more to learn, more to grow, and of course, more of Christ to engage through His Word. And so all of this brings us to the books of the Bible, and then we'll focus on a book of the Bible about which more Christians have argued and disagreed about than all the other books put together, and that is the apocalyptic books, which in our scriptures includes the Old Testament books of Daniel, parts of Ezekiel and Zechariah, and of course the New Testament book of Revelation, whose name is quite literally Apocalypsis. So we're going to kind of explore at some level what apocalyptic literature is, but our main focus will be the book of Revelation. And so up front, I want to say that this video, yes, is going to be a bit longer than all the others, simply because in order for us to engage the strange world of the apocalyptic, there's just a whole lot more that we need to know going into it. And yet there is no way that I can cover all your questions, all the things we debate about, I'm also honestly really praying that I equip groups don't downward spiral into ugly and unkind debates about some of the contents of these books. But one of the things that makes reading these books tough is the way the culture around us uses the word apocalypse. For example, if you're interested in watching a movie and it gets described as a post-apocalyptic movie, what they mean by that is, is that it's a movie about a future time after the world has been through some kind of moment and experience where most of the planets and most of the people are destroyed. So we start reading the book of Revelation. We hear it's an apocalyptic book. And for some of us, immediately we assume that it's only about, you know, the time when earth and humanity get destroyed. And while, yes, there are definitely parts of apocalyptic literature that address this future moment of judgment, and of course, not everyone agrees about which parts, it would be a mistake to read these books assuming that that is all they are about. In fact, the English word apocalypse is simply a transliteration of the Greek word apocalypsis, which literally means to uncover or to reveal. Hence, our name for the final book of the Bible is Revelation. Not Revelations, by the way. Revelation, which means that which is being uncovered or revealed. Now, this word is not only used for kind of end time stuff. In fact, Luke 2.35 talks about our hearts being apocalypsed or revealed using the same word. Romans 1 talks about the gospel being revealed. Same word. And then we come to the first verse of Revelation, and it says that it is the revelation, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. In other words, the main object being revealed in this book is Jesus himself. The point of Revelation is Jesus, and we're going to come back to that in a second. One of the other things we need to know about apocalyptic literature is that it is more like reading Lord of the Rings that it is like reading facts in the newspaper. In other words, it makes wide use of dramatic and fantastic imagery and metaphor like beasts, and dragons and talking horns, which is what makes it so appealing, but it also makes reading and interpreting the genre so challenging. Now, everyone agrees that apocalyptic literature makes use of these images. Where people disagree is what these images mean as well as which images are maybe supposed to be taken more literally and which are to be taken more symbolically. Martin Luther, the German reformer, wasn't sure that Revelation should even be in the Bible. John Calvin, another great theologian, he wrote commentaries on every other book of the Bible, 
but he didn't write a commentary on the book of Revelation. Now, I do not for one second profess to have a greater understanding of scripture than these two giants. So I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that for some of the reasons that I've mentioned, as well as some of the reasons that we're still going to touch on, let's approach these books with some humility and a willingness to learn. That doesn't in any way mean that we can't have convictions about what we believe in the book of Revelation and Daniel, for example. But as with the other books of Scripture, be careful to assume that the first thing that pops into your head when you read the Bible in English 2,000 years after it was written is definitely what the author meant. I mean, imagine our culture came and went, and then somebody from the distant future found a news headline that said, Springboks decimate the Kiwis. Now, I love that headline, but imagine the debates where you get the camp that believes that there was this massive battle between a bunch of Springboks and a bunch of Kiwi birds, and the Springboks literally annihilated the Kiwis. And then you get the other camp who knew that these were images representing different countries. And so they believed there was a war between South Africa and New Zealand, which South Africa won. And then, of course, there were others who maybe knew a little bit more about the historical setting and knew that it meant that we destroyed them in rugby, which would be amazing, right? All of those positions are trying to be true to the language and even to the different degrees of awareness to the historical moments. Now, while there are definitely some weird and weak and wacky understandings of the book of Revelation, most of the stronger historical views have some incredible arguments for their support. And they have had Bible-loving, Jesus-loving, incredible scholars who have argued for different positions. They have also had their criticisms, and they have had ways of trying to address those criticisms well and biblically. And so in the same way, let's grow in our convictions, but let's also hold them with kind of an appropriate amount of doggedness, if you know what I mean. Now, one of the values we've come back to many times when it comes to understanding Scripture is that Scripture was written for me, not to me. In other words, when we assume that the book of Revelation is only about some future events, then we are ignoring the fact that John had real occasion to write to real Christians who were going through some real issues, and this book needed to make sense to them, needed to encourage them. And so what was going on that made this book needed to be written? Well, while scholars disagree about the exact timing of the book of Revelation, all are agreed that John, who, by the way, at this time was being exiled for his faith, is writing in order to comfort and encourage Christians who in different ways were being politically and physically persecuted for their faith in Christ. Historians tell us some of the cruel ways that Christians were publicly put to death for simply being Christians. And so it would be a cruel joke if John was saying, Hey guys, I, I know you're going through a bit of a rough patch and I've got something from Jesus. It's just not for you. Only some dudes in some time in the distant future. And so the primary meaning of the book of Revelation is understanding what John meant and how the original readers would have understood it in the context of being comforted and encouraged in light of the persecution they were going through. Now, the book of Revelation also has a prophetic element to it, kind of adding to its complexity, which among many things also means that there may be secondary layers of meaning that the Holy Spirit could have implied that can be applied to other times of history, maybe past, present, future, but I'm hoping you're understanding that the primary purpose of John writing this book is to encourage and strengthen believers who are starting to wonder because of the persecution if Satan was winning. So this book is an incredible and powerful reminder that while it may seem that way, Jesus wins. Jesus is on the throne. His people are vindicated and restored. So remain 
faithful. Remain committed to him because his victory is certain. Let me show this in another way. Two words that people love debating about concerning revelation and end times, the words rapture and antichrist are literally not anywhere at all in the book of Revelation. Yet the words that come up the most in the book of Revelation are the words throne, lamb, and witness. And so what is the book about? It's about Jesus, the lamb who was slain, who is still on the throne. And so remain faithful under this trial as a witness to the true king. So to encourage and comfort these believers, Jesus, through John's writing, pulls back the curtain, reveals himself, reveals his perspective, and oftentimes difficult to interpret images. These images are a rich combination of images from the Old Testament scriptures, as well as images that more than likely would have made a whole lot more sense to the readers of the time, where some of what Jesus reveals includes where history is going, so that they and us can be confident in who wins. And so we are called, all of us, to remain faithful through all kinds of trial. So knowing this and knowing the main emphases of the book of Revelation, I think it helps align our own emphases as we read this. And yes, we can debate as to the how and the when and the hows and the whens of these images. But let that not detract from the very clear goal intended by Christ for his church, both then and then all generations of churches experiencing this kind of opposition. So please don't read this book looking for confirmation of your aforemade conclusions, but rather read and study. Become a learner, a learner of scripture, of these Old Testament allusions and images, of the historical context how different people have faithfully tried to make sense of this. Let your convictions grow, evolve, develop. And I know this may sound rather simplistic, but let's be clear where there is clarity and let's be humble where there is less clarity. But what is clear is the supremacy and victory of Christ over all who oppose him and our blessed participation in the renewal of all things and in his victory. God bless you.